might have happened the day before when you know a best friend might have just been smashed to pieces uh, and, and so the re reaction it's very very tough but I think the more that we can understand that we're going to, that we're going to get a lot further respect than we are by, by uh, arrogance uh, the better off we're going to be um, and that in turn well, well then we reconvene and we did work out Because uh, what's happened, unfortunately, is despite the billions that have flowed into Afghanistan, uh, very little has made its way to the village level. And you find that so much of it gets siphoned off by the warlords and the government and what have you. So uh, these, and these people, the, these Taliban commanders, uh, among their many feelings at the top of the list, they just absolutely hate the warlords. And they also think that the American military Because of that interaction with them, uh, we found ourselves in a position to play a pretty key role uh, when called upon to do so in the, uh, securing the release of the hostages, which is the uh, After the second one was killed, uh, I received a call from a Christian friend who asked if we could uh, do anything in this situation. So we called upon our, we have two indigenous a number of bullets in the back of the It was dark and they didn't see what was going on. So he had hunkered down in the Madrasa and they were calling him six days later. Fortunately, he responded. And what he did was he, he found out uh, who the spokesman was for the captor and then got uh, religiously together both in Pakistan and had some relationship with those spokesmen. And he took those in, sort of informally constituted what is called a jurga, like a decision-making body of respected elders. Uh, instead of a parliament, you know, uh, uh, Afghanistan has a jurga, but at all levels you have these jurgas. And this sat down with the captain, spoke to him, with open Qurans, uh, you know, in the first hour they asked him, what are you going to release? Majority of the captives were women. So they worked on this for about a week. And then they had to leave because everybody was sick as a dog from the local water. And they also felt they had said what they were going to say in so many different ways as it could be said. So as they left, they, ex uh, they were extracted three uh, uh, agreements from them. From the captors, one was that, uh, that no f no uh, further hostages would be harmed. Uh, uh, second, they, they agreed to release four or five women as a sign of good intent. And uh, finally, uh, they would engage with the Korean delegation that had been sent over, but uh, there had not been any contact. So they did engage. We uh, tried very hard. We were unable to uh, inform the Korean delegation of their willingness to release four to five hostages. So when the Koreans met with them, uh, they asked for the release of those who were sick, and only two were sick. So they released two, and you know, two or three were left on the table, so to speak. Um, but those talks broke down after about six days. So then we reconstituted the nucleus of the original. Uh, uh, Jurga, and added to it three former cabinet officials from the Taliban government. It was uh, Secretary of Defense, Secretary of Minister of Defense, and Minister of Finance, and the third. And they had a lot of influence. So they went in there and spent a week, and then the hostages were released.
so that you, you never quite know exactly where you're going to end up. Invited by the Secretary of Business Affairs to, to bring together to mount a conference between Afghan political leaders and religious leaders around the challenges of development assistance. And it's a pretty strategic exercise that we're undertaking, and I'm not sure how successful we're going to be. Uh, because what's strategic about it is that the uh, religious community is the lifeblood for the Taliban. The Taliban is development assistance to try to drive uh, the West out of the country. So at the same time, both sides seem to care a lot about the, the plight of the people they, uh, they're concerned with. So we've had our first preliminary regional meeting, which brought about 80 of these folks together with uh, several We also have an opportunity uh, uh, to uh, provide some training for the Shura Councils. Uh, excuse me, wrong. Ulam Councils. Uh, there's an Ulam uh, Council in each one of the three four provinces. And these are the religious figures who sort of decide collectively what's going to happen in that province and what's not going to happen in that province. Religiously. So if they don't want a road built, uh, a road is to be built. Uh, these sort of, so they've got a lot of hammer, if you will. So we're, we're trying to see if we can start the raising the funds to do that. And we also need to raise additional funds to complete this process between political and religious. Uh, but let me let me just conclude with that uh, and, and and add that you know um, just as setting a counter fire is often the best antidote for a blaze that's raging out of control. Uh, I submit to you that uh, one of the best antidotes for religious extremism is religious reconciliation. Uh, the best antidote for bad theology is good theology. Um, and this business of trying to make religion part of the solution is not without its challenges. Uh, first, you probably need uh, you know, a certain set of skills also uh, physically, emotionally, psychologically trained. It's not without its risks. More than one spiritually motivated peacemaker has paid the ultimate price for their efforts. But despite the risks, whatever discomfort one may feel in navigating the relatively uncharted waters of spiritual engagement, I submit that the stakes are simply too high for us. Thank you very much. Happy to take any questions you'd like.